There are seas, mountains, dunes, although not from sand, but from heat-resistant organic matter. And when summer comes to the North Pole, it even rains methane. It's an amazing world. Indeed, we are talking about Titan, Saturn's biggest moon, the second largest moon in the solar system, after Jupiter's satellite Ganymede. It is the only celestial body in the solar system, with the exception of Earth and Mars, for which the existence of liquid on the surface has been proven, and it's the only moon on the planet with a dense atmosphere. The diameter of Titan is 5,152 kilometers, which is 50% larger than that of the Moon, while Titan is 80% larger in mass than Earth's satellite. Titan also surpasses the planet Mercury in size, although it is smaller than it in mass. The force of gravity on it is approximately one-seventh that of the Earth's. Titan's mass makes up 95% of the mass of all of Saturn's moons. Titan conceals many of its secrets, but today we will turn our attention to its amazing landscape. Now the surface of Titan is composed mainly of water ice and sedimentary organic matter. It is geologically young and mostly flat, with the exception of a small number of mountainous formations and craters, as well as a few cryovolcanoes. For a long time, the dense atmosphere surrounding Titan made it impossible for the surface of the Moon to be seen until the arrival of the Cassini-Huygens space research mission. Scientists suspect that under the ice shell of Titan, at a depth of about a hundred kilometers, there is an ocean of liquid water. This is indicated by some irregularities in the oscillations of the Moon in its orbital motion. Photographed by the Cassini in various spectral ranges, the surface of Titan in the tropical latitudes is divided into several bright and dark regions with clear boundaries. Near the equator, on the leading hemisphere, there is a bright region the size of Australia, which is high ground, probably a mountainous area. It was named Xenadu. In general, the surface topography of Titan is relatively level. The variation in height is no more than two kilometers. However, local changes of elevation, as shown by radar data and stereoscopic images obtained by the Huygens, can be quite significant. Steep slopes on Titan are not uncommon. This is the result of intense erosion in conjunction with wind and liquid. There are several objects that look like impact craters, presumably filled with hydrocarbons. Many craters may have been buried under a layer of sediment or were quickly smoothed over by intense wind erosion. The surface of Titan in the temperature latitudes is less contrasting. Titan has distinct indications of volcanic activity. However, despite the similarity in the form and characteristics of the volcanoes, it is not silicate-based volcanoes that are at play on the satellite, as on the Earth or Mars and Venus but what are known as cryovolcanoes, which most likely erupt with a water-ammonia mixture with a touch of hydrocarbons. Unlike the Earth, in the course of the change of seasons, powerful clouds of Titan move a great deal more along the latitudes, while on Earth they move north or south only slightly. Disappearing islands on Titan have also been a huge mystery for years. The largest of them is in the mysterious seas of Kraken Mare. The depth of the seas ranges to several hundred meters. Studies of the sea, Ligia Mare, have discovered an unusual feature. Bright island-like objects that appear and disappear in some radar images. Moreover, there aren't any significant waves on these bodies of water. There are two explanations of what they can be gas bubbles or solid floating formations. It turned out that at the surface the mixture exists in the form of one phase, but at a depth of 130 to 170 meters, the ternary mixture's state changes into a combination of two liquid phases and one gaseous. The solubility of nitrogen in ethene is much lower than in methane. It is emitted as a gas. Chemists estimate the diameter of the average bubble at 4.6 centimeters. 
This size is apparently enough for them to be visible to the radar. Nevertheless, researchers would like to note that there is not enough data to give an accurate description of the processes occurring in the seas of Titan. For example, the temperature and exact composition of the seas are unknown. More accurate data may be provided by future missions to the Moon. A new target of research is Saturn's moon Titan, to which the Dragonfly mission will be launched in 2026. It's expected that in 2034 the eight-rotor drone will land on Titan, which will receive electrical power by means of a thermoelectric generator. Becoming an eyewitness to these new discoveries will truly be an exciting and amazing time. Mars, by distance, is the fourth from the Sun, and by size, the seventh planet in the solar system. We have seen the unique landscape of Mars. The extinct Martian volcano, Olympus Mons, is the tallest mountain on the planet, and the Mariner Valley is its largest known canyon, and there is a huge number of impact craters. Mars has a rotational period and a change of seasons similar to the Earth. Nonetheless, relaxing under the palm trees, which don't exist here, isn't going to happen. The average temperature on Mars is minus 40 degrees Celsius. To this very day, we are receiving a huge amount of data, some of which we already want to share as early as in 2021. One, before you are the white clouds that occasionally appear in the upper layers of the atmosphere of Mars. And as we know, clouds do not form on their own. For their formation, something is required to help the water condense. For a long time, climate models simply could not explain how they could have formed at this sort of altitude. The process consists of what is known as meteorite smoke, whose burnt residue helps the water vapor condense and turn into small particles of ice. This discovery prompted the thought that the fine dust that rises into the atmosphere after the meteorite smoke may play a role in the creation of Martian clouds very similar to how glowing noctilucent clouds appear in the Earth's massosphere. However, on the Tempe Terra, located to the north of the Tharsis volcanic plateau, the probe managed to find what are known as eskers, rather low and very long hills, 
similar in shape to railway embankments. Eskers, unlike many other glacial landforms, are formed not as a result of the movement of the ice itself, but rather of the meltwater flows, which spring out from between the edge of the foot of the glacier and the ground, and carve narrow but long channels, tens of kilometers in length. 5. Let's turn our attention to what are known as the sand spiders of Mars. No, they won't eat the settlers for a snack. They aren't that kind of spiders. But some things we know for sure are that Mars, just like the Earth, has its own weather, system of air currents and climate. And these canyons, or spiders, as observations have shown, are constantly increasing in size. What causes them to grow? Actually, Martian sand dunes and deposits of dry ice, the frozen carbon dioxide, that cover the dunes facilitate the formation of these landforms. In the summer and springtime, when the air and soil temperatures on Mars sharply increase, a portion of the ice warms and melts. As a result, the dry ice turns into carbon dioxide, a giant bubble of gas appears under the surface of the glacier, and the pressure in it increases. After some time it reaches a critical point, the ice bursts open, and the CO2 is ejected into the atmosphere of Mars through the fracture. Together with the gas, a massive amount of sand falls onto the surface of the dust-covered ice, which due to the high pressure, turns this air geyser into a sort of sandblasting machine, stripping away the surface. Therefore, the cracks through which the gas escapes grow each season and turn into the giant spiders, which can be seen in the MRO, or the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter images. It's difficult to come to grips with the fact that four billion years ago, Mars probably resembled the Earth. That means its vast expanses were most likely covered with a shallow ocean, perhaps several hundred meters deep, but not kilometers, as on the Earth. Clearly, there was water. There is already no doubt about that. However, billions and billions of years passed, and Mars rapidly died, becoming cold and losing almost all of its atmosphere. Astonishing Pluto was discovered by astronomer Clyde Tombo in 1930, the ninth in order, when still a planet, it was named in honor of the god of the underworld, Pluto. The planet's orbit takes the shape of an elongated ellipse with a significant slope of 17 degrees to the flat plane of motion of the other planets. A complete revolution around the Sun takes Pluto 247 years and intermittently for periods of almost 20 years, it happens to be closer to the Sun than Neptune. Pluto's diameter is 2,374 kilometers. Pluto's mass is almost six times less than the mass of the Moon. It weighs 480 times less than the Earth. And its diameter is two-thirds that of the diameter of our natural satellite. However, so far very little is known about how they formed and what is happening in them under the multi-kilometer shell. But all the same, the results of the survey were a real surprise to the mission's directors. No one had imagined that distant Pluto would not look at all like a smooth billiard ball, but would have an extremely complex relief, reflecting the history of its origins. In the new images, 
Pluto turns out to be covered with recently formed mountains, ice plains, methane ice dunes, and even icebergs drifting through nitrogen. In addition to that, the ice crust of the celestial body is strewn with countless cracks that looked like traces of recent tectonic activity. They were the first indication of the existence of a giant subsurface ocean on this dwarf planet. Soon other evidence emerged supporting the presence of liquid water under the planet's icy crust. But how and when it originated on Pluto remains a mystery to this day. But we now know that at one time Pluto was originally cold. This means that it grew slowly, accumulating ice material from the outer solar system and at first there was no ocean on it. Water in liquid form only appeared on Pluto after the core of the dwarf planet warmed up as a result of the radioactive decay of aluminium-26 and gravitational interactions with its satellite, Charon. In this scenario, geologic faults in the celestial body would have retained signs of surface compression. Why compression specifically? The fact is that the heat emanating from the depth of the planet would melt the lower layers of the ice, turning it into liquid water, which as you know takes up less space. As a consequence, Pluto's ice crust would have begun to contract, which would lead to the formation of distinctive geological traces. And what have we learned about Pluto's atmosphere and climate? Pluto's atmosphere is predominantly composed of nitrogen, with minor traces of methane, ethene, ethylene and other gases. It is extremely thin. It has a pressure about 1000 times less than that of the atmospheric pressure on Earth. Nonetheless, it has great influence not only on the climate, but also on the geology of the dwarf planet. For example, it facilitates the equalizing of the temperatures of the different regions of Pluto and because of the greenhouse effect created by methane, the temperature of the planet's surface increases. Also, new data have demonstrated that some segments of the surface of the dwarf planet actually have snow caps, which are formed in a completely different way than they are on Earth. If on Earth, we are often able to observe the conversion of clouds into snow on mountaintops since temperature decreases with increasing altitude, then on Pluto there is conceptually the inverse process. Since the atmosphere there becomes hotter as the altitude increases, correspondingly, the physiochemical traits of the process of the formation of snow and snow caps on Pluto differ dramatically. In this case, calling it methane ice is the most accurate conclusion. And finally, it turned out that the change of seasons on Pluto occurs not because of the tilt of the planet's axis of rotation as on the Earth, but is due to the elongated orbit. Over the course of a revolution around the Sun, which takes roughly 250 Earth years, the amount of heat received by Pluto changes almost three times. As a result, the density of the atmosphere fluctuates significantly. In the long summer, which lasts a little less than half of the Plutonian year, the frozen gases evaporate and in the winter they again revert to a solid state. They evaporate from the most brightly lit and warmed areas and settle in colder areas. This process ensures that gases are carried over the surface of the planet and over millions of years have sculpted the most amazing forms of relief. What comes next? New Horizons has raised more new questions for us than it has cleared up old ones. But most unfortunately, no new missions to Pluto are planned for the near future. So it will be a long time before we get new information comparable in value to that which was received from New Horizons.
located at the center of most, if not all, galaxies, are supermassive black holes with a mass of millions or billions of times greater than the Sun's mass. For example, in the center of our galaxy is Sagittarius A, whose mass amounts to about 4.5 million suns. Of the known black holes, the one with the smallest mass is only five times more massive than our star, but 100,000 times more compact. The diameter of some black holes is no more than the expanse of a large city, but the weight of such a munchkin is like 5,000 suns. The radius of others is comparable to the radius of the Earth, but their mass is six million times greater than that of our planet. It simply gets lost against the background of, say, the hole in the center of the Messier 60 galaxy, which has a mass of 4.7 billion suns. The class of ultramassive black holes begins at around this mass, the largest of which are made up of even as many as 4.5 billion suns. But even they seem to be cosmic infants. Currently, the largest known black hole is the Ton 618 quasar, which has the mass of 66 billion times the mass of the Sun. It is located near the North Pole of the galaxy, in the constellation of Cain's Venatici, the hunting dogs. The Ton 618 quasar is believed to have an accretion disk of hot gas orbiting the giant black hole at the center of the galaxy. The quasar is estimated to be 3.18 giga per sec or 10.37 billion light years away. The emission lines in the spectrum of Ton 618 are usually wide, which tells us that the gas in the accretion disk is moving at very high speed, about 7,000 kilometers per second. The galaxy, in the center of which the quasar is located, is not visible from Earth due to the brightness of the quasar itself. Its absolute stellar magnitude is 140 trillion times greater than that of the Sun. It is precisely because of this that the exact mass cannot be determined. What can't be said about this new challenger, which has the name Holm 15A. Holmberg 15A is a type CD supergiant elliptical galaxy that is located in the Abel 85 galaxy cluster in the constellation of Cetus, about 700 million light years from the Sun. The galaxy of type CD is a subclass of the giant elliptical galaxies of morphological class D. Such galaxies have large stellar halos and can be found near the centers of some large galaxy clusters. They are often considered as potentially the largest representative of galaxies in the universe. Holmberg 15A was discovered in 1937 by Eric Holmberg. The galaxy became famous after it was announced that it had the largest of all observed galactic cores sprawling about 15,000 light years in expanse. But then the discovery was refuted. Now Holm 15A is taking the lead again. The fact is that the Abel 85 cluster has its velocity dispersion in a dark halo of about 750 kilometers per second, which can only be explained by the presence of a supermassive black hole with an immense mass of at least 170 billion solar masses. Although the halo of dark matter is not subject to this kind of scaling, but the evolution of a black hole in dark matter has nothing to do with baryonic matter. Notably, among known objects, this is one with the heaviest supermassive black holes. This classic case tells us that the main component of the galactic core is a supermassive black hole with a mass of about 40 billion solar masses and a radius of about 790 astronomical units. By comparison, Pluto is located at a distance of about 39.5 astronomical units away. However, according to the data, the gamma radiation from the object is so extensive that some researchers estimate Holm 15A at 310 billion solar masses. How is it possible? Let's try to figure out this galactic mystery. 
it became obvious from observation that the distribution of stellar orbits was shifting more and more towards tangential motion inside the core. However, the displacement is less than in that of other elliptical galaxies with cores. This tells us that in earlier time there was a merging of galaxies with black holes. Astronomers have detected that the observed magnitude of tangential anisotropy and the shape of the light profile are consistent with a formation scenario where Holm 15A is remnant of the merger of two supergiant black holes. And now the masses of black holes in galaxies with cores, including Holm 15A, are proportionally scaled inversely with the brightness of the star's central surface and the density of the mass, respectively. That is precisely why black hole Holm 15A has taken the position as one of the largest and hungriest supermassive black holes. The new estimate of its size is from 40 to 310 billion solar masses and its rate of accretion of matter is estimated from about 8,000 to 45,000 times more massive than the black hole in the center of the Milky Way. If the black hole in our galaxy were to accumulate that much matter, it would have to mercilessly swallow two-thirds of all the stars in the Milky Way. Further research will reveal the secrets of this object, but no matter what, the Holm 15A black hole is the heaviest among all that have been discovered thus far. One of the places in the solar system that is worthy of notice and examination is located at an average distance of 250 million kilometers from us and stretches out for more than one astronomical unit. That is to say, the distance of the Earth from the Sun. This region is located between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. As you may have already guessed, we are talking about the asteroid belt a place where there is an accumulation of a variety of small celestial bodies of every possible size and shape. On May 3, 2011, a probe took the first photograph of Vesta from a distance of just over 1 million kilometers, after which an active phase of studying this asteroid began. By June 27, the craft had slowed down, approaching closer to Vesta all the time. And after another month, having already made almost two revolutions around the Sun, the craft reached Vesta and switched to an orbit around it at an altitude of 16,000 kilometers. All of July, the craft was engaged in photographing of the surface of Vesta. The probe confirmed just how large the Rhea Silvia crater in Vesta's southern hemisphere is, about 500 kilometers in diameter and 19 kilometers deep. The spacecraft also revealed that the mountain in the center of the huge crater, which the Hubble telescope had once captured, is more than two times the height of Mount Everest and is the second tallest mountain in the solar system, taking a back seat to the Martian Olympus. Upon closer inspection, the probe found a second large impact basin, now called Veninia, that is partially covered by the younger Rhea Silvia basin. These two impacts changed the surface of Vesta and probably almost destroyed it. It remains a mystery how Vesta was able to survive such an extraordinary cataclysm. 
it is probable that numerous Class V asteroids, debris from the impact, were scattered in all directions. Giant impacts have created dozens of gorges encircling Vesta's equator that were revealed in the probe's images. Some of these canyons rival the Grand Canyon in size, reaching 465 kilometers in length and 4 kilometers in depth. The probe's data also reveals that the massive impact formed Rio Silvia a mere billion years ago. Thus, the surface of the southern hemisphere looks younger than the northern, where a tremendous number of craters have been preserved. Previously, researchers thought Vesta was a substantially dry object, but the Dawn space probe detected water-rich minerals on Vesta's surface that are associated with carbon-rich material. These materials were presumably taken to Vesta by asteroids or comets from the outer solar system that is richer in volatile substances. On September 5, 2012, having completed an extended mission, the craft broke free of Vesta's orbit and headed toward the next object of research, Ceres, a transition which took two and a half years. On March 6, 2015, having traversed a total of 4.9 billion kilometers at a distance of 60,600 kilometers from it, the craft was captured in the dwarf planet's gravitational field. And in early June, at a distance of 4,400 kilometers from the surface, the first photographs were already obtained. While the Vesta observations broadly supported the existing hypothesis and provided more details to fill in the gaps, less was known about Ceres. In fact, most of what we now know about the dwarf planet was provided by the Dawn spacecraft. Initial calculations suggested that Ceres might be separated into layers, although the composition of these layers was unknown before the probe. Given a low average density, Ceres was expected to have a large amount of water ice under its surface. However, the probe's measurements have confirmed that Ceres is actually composed of a rocky core and a crust of water ice covered by a dusty outer layer. Dawn also uncovered evidence of the presence of clothrate hydrates, a gas trapped in the crystalline structure of the water molecules that makes the amazing strength and low cross density of Ceres possible. While a large portion of Ceres is relatively smooth due to its semi-liquid subsurface layer of ice, the spacecraft found a large mountain that it wasn't able to see previously. This mountain is about 4 kilometers high and is called Ahuna Mons. Its well-defined domed shape, similar to volcanoes on Earth, suggests that it was likely formed due to cryovolcanic activity. Although cryovolcanism may exist in other icy worlds, Dawn's observations make Mount Ahuna the closest known cryovolcano in the solar system. Other observations by the Herschel Space Observatory have shown small amounts of water vapor around several portions of Ceres, which suggests that it may have a weak atmosphere or even ongoing cryovolcanic activity. The probe revealed that this gas could be due to solar particles colliding with the water ice on Ceres, which is then released as vapor, resulting in a temporary, weak atmosphere. Spectroscopic data from Dawn also confirmed the presence of ammonia on the surface of the dwarf planet. Conditions in the main asteroid belt are too warm for ammonia to form, which requires much colder conditions and which raises questions about its origins. Ceres could have formed much further away in the colder, outer portion of the solar system before migrating to its current position, or ammonia could have been brought to Ceres by celestial bodies from the outer solar system. The spacecraft also confirmed the presence of carbonates on Ceres, which had been detected 10 years earlier using telescopic data. A great quantity of them once again confirmed the existence of an ocean early in Ceres' history. This dwarf planet may even be warm enough to have a small amount of liquid water remaining below the surface. It's astonishing that for two centuries the dwarf planets Ceres and Vesta appear to be no more than dim points of light among the stars, until the Dawn mission provided us with detailed investigative portraits of these two complex and fascinating alien worlds.
The universe of Dune, or the Duneverse, is a fictional universe that was conceived by the writer Frank Herbert and depicted by him in the Chronicles of Dune series of books, which was recreated. However, we will focus on the most awesome creation of the author, both in size and in fame, the Sandworm. It may be considered to be the signature element of the Herbert saga, the worm, infamously known as Shai Hulud by the inhabitants of the desert, is not merely a giant creature of Arrakis, but is also a philosophical symbol. In John Schoenher's illustration for the first magazine publication of Dune, 1965, the worm's mouth consists of three parts, though it is not specified anywhere in the novel that the creature's jaws are arranged in such a manner. The artist later created several cover designs in the same vein, the idea was adopted by the designers of David Lynch's 1984 screen adaptation. As for obvious reasons, we won't be seeing large sandworms on our planet, furrowing through the Sahara or the Atacama Desert of Chile, and you can be confident it's for the best. But nobody knows what the chances are of finding a creature in deep space that resembles the creation of the science fiction writer. We propose taking this topic into consideration in greater detail and to answer the question, could the worm Shai Hulud possibly exist in reality? To begin with, let's clarify what this giant crawling creature is. Now then, according to Herbert's description, the sandworm is composed of 100 to 400 individual segments enclosed in a thick, silvery-gray, leathery shell. Each of the segments has its own primitive nervous system, so it is almost impossible to kill the worm. Even if one of the segments is destroyed, the other parts will take over its functions. Sandworms are enormous, 400 meters in length and the largest individuals exceed 2 kilometers. The mouth of the worm measures 80 meters in diameter. Just imagine a huge mouth the size of a 26-story building surrounded by a multitude of sharp teeth. Yes, indeed, Shai Hulud is every fisherman's worst nightmare. But the most distinctive aspect is that the worm from Herbert's universe is not a member of the animal kingdom, but a silicon-based life form that fears water. All living creatures we know have common basic features. They grow, reproduce, respond to environmental stimuli, are able to adapt and sometimes change. In addition, they have a common basis for all biochemistry. They are made of long chains of carbon molecules use water for metabolism and energy. But it is possible that a non-carbon based life form exists somewhere and that such a life form would be very different from what we are used to. The ability of carbon to form long chains makes it an ideal base for the building of sufficiently complex molecules that the body requires to carry out vital functions. Yes, carbon is great for forming complex molecules but it's not the only element in nature that can do it. There is also silicon, which sits under carbon on the periodic table of elements. This tells us that theoretically such a life form is possible. In addition, if a sandworm generates oxygen, then the question arises, what does it use as a source of energy?
The Milky Way is a relatively medium-sized galaxy, which has nevertheless been able to provide a home to about one billion planets. Each of these worlds possesses its own unique features and characteristics that are sometimes radically different from those we are used to seeing on Earth. One of these unusual worlds could be a rocky planet that orbits four stars at once in the same system. Between one and a half and two astronomical units from the center of the system meet HD 98800. It is a multiple system of four stars located in the constellation crater approximately 150 light years from us. What can such a world signify? What kind of phenomena can occur on this planet? A bit later, we will definitely be imaginatively transported to this extraordinary world. Yes, in space there are more complex star systems with two, or even more rarely, three stars, which spin around each other in complex orbits. However, this new discovery is proof that this is not the limit. A group of astronomers were able to detect a system in the universe with four stars. Amazingly, all this time it was hiding a mere 146 light years from us. Instances of systems that consist of four stars are incredibly rare. However, the uniqueness of this object is further enhanced by the fact that HD 98800b has a protoplanetary disk. Using the Spitzer Space Telescope, Astronomers discovered that it is composed of two belts. The outer belt is separated from the center of a double star by 5.9 astronomical units, almost the same distance separating Jupiter from the Sun. Researchers suspect that this belt is made up of comets and asteroids. The inner belt is located at a distance of two astronomical units from the center as Mars is from the Sun and it looks like it is formed of fine dust. This kind of division of the protoplanetary disk into sections usually occurs during the formation of a planet but in this case it came about most likely for another reason under the influence of the gravity of neighboring mate HD 98800A. How is it possible? The fact is that in most systems it is aligned in respect to the main star. For example, in a solar system all the planets and most of the asteroids spin approximately on the same plane with the Sun. But this does not apply to HD 98800. It has a disk of gas and dust that is positioned at a right angle to the central stars. This is the first system that is known to us with a perpendicular disk and such an anomaly promises many more astonishing discoveries. Presumably, if astronomers manage to find other similar older systems, it will be possible to observe planets spinning in strange orbits at all sorts of angles. In turn, this might lead to the formation of new types of planets still unknown to science. However, another scenario is also possible. In such conditions, planets simply cannot form from a protoplanetary disk. The search remains to be continued. In space, there are still many curiosities unknown to mankind. On the other hand, we now understand that planetary formation can, at the very least, begin in these polar circumbinary disks. If the remaining portion of a planet's formation process can occur, there may be an entire population of displaced near-Earth planets that we have yet to discover with such things as odd seasonal variations. But although planetary formation may begin, it is unclear to what extent planets can form and remain stable in such a seemingly chaotic system. However, if planets were to exist, the view from one of them in a system like this would be amazing. A hypothetical observer would see a bright streak rising from the horizon across the entire sky. From time to time, stars will pass across it. 
and since the system consists of four celestial bodies, a total of four suns would be visible in the sky. Because of this, such a planet would have an intricate system of change of seasons, which couldn't be compared with the Earth seasons of the year. An exoplanet that is about 1.35 times the size of Earth and eight times more massive is orbiting the brightest star in the system and in doing so receives five times more solar radiation from its star. The researchers calculate that the detected object will make a transit all the way across the front of its star, allowing observers from Earth to see the barely perceptible reduction of the light emitted by the star. The incredibly powerful effect of the four celestial bodies is literally tearing this planet apart. And the extremely high temperatures and high levels of radiation make this place absolutely unsuitable for the emergence of biological life. The case. Mariners and explorers of the past have speculated about this fact. For example, in 1911, expeditions extracted 15 kilograms of geological samples some of which bore the imprints of fossil leaves from the Permian period. According to paleontological and geological data, this plant grew exclusively in the tropics. And unlike the finds collected by a Swedish expedition, its leaves were not found near the edge of the Arctic Circle, but almost at the pole itself. Fifty years later, in the 1960s, this find became one of the main arguments in favor of the theory of plate tectonics. In light of the fact that traces of similar plants have been found in Australia, New Zealand, India, Africa and South America, it presupposes the existence of a single southern supercontinent called Gondwana. Nowadays, thanks to technology, research is even more productive. Evidence of rainforest growth in Antarctica was obtained from a core sample of sediment deposit taken from the seabed near the 90 million year old Sosnovy Ostrov glacier. During the first stage, the team discovered a fascinating dense network of roots that spread throughout the entire layer of soil which was so well preserved that not only could countless traces of pollen, spores and the remains of flowering plants be seen, but even individual cell structures could be distinguished. New evidence has shown that the ancient polar landscape wasn't merely comprised of temperate forests, but temperate tropical rainforests. This means that the climate of the present ice-cold continent was not just temperate then, but substantially warmer than had previously been assumed. Antarctica was a completely different world. It was alive and flourishing in every sense. In addition to the dense and rich vegetation, here various animals, herbivores, omnivores and carnivores could be found. Among them were also arboreal forms of animals by all appearances, the same as Marumbiotherium glacialis, a small marsupial, something resembling a mouse or a possum. Perhaps small sloths that looked very similar to modern-day ones could be encountered on the branches. Among land animals, the most numerous were representatives of the Sparnotheriodontidae family of mammals, a group of extinct South American ungulates or hoofed mammals that somewhat resembled horses. Judging by the structure of the teeth, they were herbivores and reached a body mass of up to 400 kilograms. Also on land, one could come across flightless or cursorial birds, one was ostrich-like and the other carnivorous and probably quite dangerous. Along the shores of the ancient Antarctic Peninsula, one might run into king-sized penguins and in the sky falconiforms, falcons and caracaras. In the lakes, temnospodnils waited for prey. They were giant crocodile-like amphibians, for example, Antarcticus polidon. Reptiles of all kinds roamed the land. Impressive, massive predators, a small lizard-like insectivore, Prolacerta, and of course, dinosaurs.
it was not just a Jurassic Park, but a whole continent. The most exotic of them was the Cryolophosaurus eliotti, the ice crest lizard, the narrow skull measuring 65 centimeters, with a huge mouth studded with sharp teeth, could have swallowed a slow-moving person, if of course there had been any at that time. He lived on the dry land about 200 million years ago, as did many others when Antarctica was free of ice. Another interesting creature was the glacialisaurs, a sauropodomorph, and distant relative of the famous giant long-necked sauropods. However, the glacialisaurs was much more modest in size. In all likelihood, it averaged 7.6 meters in length, besides weighing significantly less, 4 to 7 tons, which permitted it to rise briefly on two legs. Who would have thought that 90 million years ago, near the South Pole, the average air temperature in the summer was 19 degrees Celsius, that it was a tropical, green world, rich in flora and fauna. Now these are cold lands, similar to Mars. So what happened? What sort of climatic occurrence could have prompted such global changes? A giant meteorite? Maybe a great worldwide flood? Or perhaps the expansion of the Tasman Strait between Antarctica and Australia, which in previous geological epochs formed the single continent? No matter whatever happened, the thriving world came to an end. A new era had arrived, the era of the Ice Ages. And as it seems, after millions of years, this is normal for planets of the same type as the Earth. Who knows what cold worlds, hundreds of light years away from us, are hiding under a thick layer of ice. Taking all these factors into account, according to researchers' most conservative and modest estimates, the group of colonizers should initially consist of 98 people. Besides, each of the 49 married couples should, to begin with, be selected by DNA analysis in order to ensure maximum genetic diversity. 
If a smaller crew were to set out on the voyage, the success of the mission would already be in question. For example, the chances of survival for 25 married couples is already estimated at about 50%. And if there are only 32 or even fewer settlers, the odds leave them no chance at all, 0%. Perhaps the descendants of the original crew will reach Proxima Centauri, but by that time they will no longer be able to establish a sustainable colony. But this poses the question, but what if we use cryonics or suspended animation? This is a type of hibernation that can be beneficial in helping the travelers to conserve emotional resources and avoid burnout. It is possible, but not for long. In fact, for much shorter than we think, since this sort of hibernation carries risks, even if people go into it for several months and not years. The consequences may not be reversible, and from what was a strong team, all that will remain will be exhausted and depressed travelers. Therefore, we're back to the old scenario. So having left the Earth behind, the 98 space travelers will give birth to children and they to grandchildren, even during the lifetime of the first generation. So judging by the calculations, the maximum population on the Ark could reach 500 people. And this means that the colonists will have to provide themselves with food on their own. In other words, grow it directly on board the ship. But how much food do they need? After all, the size of the ship depends on this and therefore the energy required to move it. These calculations require taking not only the size of the crew into account, but also the average age of the spaceship's inhabitants, their height, weight, and level of physical activity. In order to understand how many calories they will each need annually. If the ship is constructed in the form of a rotating cylinder so that the centrifugal force provides artificial gravity, then the height of the agricultural compartment should be 320 meters with a radius of 224 meters. Add to this the crew's quarters, the common areas such as a dining room, a gym or a medical unit, the flight control rooms, the power generators and the engines, and the size of the spaceship will approximately double in size. The space arc will be approximately 650 meters long and 450 meters in diameter. Almost half a million liters of portable water will be required. But we have circulation that runs around the ship, so everything works. Keep in mind that our flight is very long, and yes, most likely we personally will not be able to reach our star with the speed indicated in the task. More precisely, it will be possible to get there, but it will take about 500 years. Of course, it is possible that fewer psychological problems will arise for the subsequent generations who will have been born on the ship. Inside, there is an entire world. There are 24 habitats each with its own unique flora, fauna and weather conditions. Hundreds of people will have been born and died during the journey. Now there are about 2,000 inhabitants. For them, the ship has been their home all their lives. But very soon, this will change. The ship has begun to decelerate and it will take a mere 10 years to reach the destination. Ahead is a new world, a new planet, a new hope for mankind. And perhaps during the time while the colonists were on their way, the planet became habitable. Who knows? Who knows? As you can see, we had to disregard some things and violate a lot of others. Interstellar journeys are still a fantasy for us. 
But what kind of fantasy doesn't become reality after a while? Europa is the biggest moon of Jupiter, the huge ocean beneath the surface. The satellite's water under a huge layer of ice does not freeze because of the hot core of Europa, which is heated by Jupiter's gravity. This became known in the early 2000s thanks to the Galileo probe, which detected marks of an electrically conductive liquid under the surface of Europa. It also discovered that the surface is made of ice and that it's one of the smoothest in the solar system. It might seem that this is where our knowledge ends, but this is not true. Over the past 20 years, and especially recently, we have learned a lot of exciting details about this distant satellite. We offer to ponder on some of them and reflect on to what degree this distant world can be alive. So Europa also known as Jupiter 2, is the sixth moon of Jupiter, the smallest of the four Galilean satellites. It was discovered in 1610 by Galileo Galilei. Over the centuries, more and more comprehensive observations of Europe were made with telescopes and since the 70s of the 20th century with flying spacecraft. Europa is slightly smaller than the moon, with a diameter of 3,122 kilometers it is the sixth in size among satellites and the 15th among all objects in the solar system. Water entered the atmosphere at a rate of about 2,360 liters per second. If the dwellers of Europe were in that stream, that would have been their last attraction. The good news is, those inhabitants who would manage not to be blown to the outer space would be very easy to find, as the surface of Europe is one of the flattest in the solar system. The tallest formations that can be found here are merely several hundred meters. If we take a close look at Europa's surface images, we will see signs of endogenous geological activity, such as lines, lenticles, bumps and pits, and the so-called Connemara cows below the center. The high albedo of the satellite indicates that the surface of the ice is pretty clean and young. It is believed that the cleaner the ice on the surface of the icy satellites, the younger it is. Let's also pay attention to the plains. Smooth plains can be formed by the activity of cryovolcanoes, which erupt to the surface, filling areas with spreading and hardening water. From Europa's orbit, we can see a chaotic relief that has different geometric shapes. We can also observe areas which are dominated by lines and stripes, ridges usually doubled, as well as impact craters. Their number is small. There are only 40 named craters over 5 kilometers in diameter, which suggests that the surface is relatively young, from 20 to 180 million years old. So Europe has high geological activity. The spectral analysis of the dark lines and spots of the structure shows presence of salts, magnesium sulfate in particular. The reddish hue allows to assume the presence of iron and sulfur compounds as well. Apparently, they are contained in the ocean of Europa and are ejected to the surface through clefts and then freeze. In addition, 
traces of hydrogen peroxide and strong acids were found. For instance, there is a high chance that Europa contains sulfuric acid hydrate. Let's land on that interesting object. As it turns out, it's not that easy. The thing is, Jupiter's moon Europa is surrounded by a region of sharp ice needles which stretches along the entire equator and is extremely dangerous for space probes to land on. Ice needles, also known as calgospores in Europa, can reach up to 15 meters in height. Large as they are, these structures still cannot be seen on the images of Europe available to us so far. A few careful maneuvers and we landed. Phew! We managed not to damage our spacecraft by this gigantic icicle. The incredible view of Europe opens to our eyes. Its surface is very cold compared to the Earth. The temperature here is 150-190 degrees Celsius below zero. But that is not the main thing to worry about here. The radiation level on Europe is extremely high, as the satellite's orbit passes through the powerful radiation belt of Jupiter. The daily dose of radiation here is nearly a million times bigger than on Earth. This dose is enough to cause severe radiation sickness. But no worries, we have a proper radiation protection. At least, we hope so. Well, with this in mind, we are sending a tunnel robot with a nuclear reactor into the deep of Europe that could drill ice while collecting ice and water samples and sending information to the surface via fiber optic cable. Surprisingly, Europe has several layers of ocean, separated by different types of ice, formed at different depths and under different pressures. It is likely that in each of these layers, different life forms might be found. Species that have adapted to the particular conditions of the ocean stratum may exist. However, if these life forms turn out to be unlike anything we have seen on Earth, it might be difficult for us to recognize them. And besides, we might not find life there at all. But these thoughts wouldn't stop our curiosity, would they? <laughs>